Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Adamson. Welcome to Craft in the American Museum, Authenticity and Artifice, on behalf of the Henry Luce Foundation and our hosts at the New York Historical Society. I want to welcome you to the Conversations on American Art and Museums, which is a celebration of the Luce American Art Program's 40th anniversary. Hope you've had a chance to tune in to some of the other talks in this series. I'm uh, just going to read a quick introduction of the series and then our two speakers. Uh, so here we go. Since its founding in 1982, the American Art Program has provided support totaling $215 million to 500 museums across all 50 states. It continues to award approximately $7.5 million annually for innovative museum products, projects in the visual arts. Through this work, Luce seeks to advance the role of visual arts in an open and equitable society and the potential for museums to serve as public forums for art-centered conversations that celebrate creativity, explore difference, and seek common ground. With an eye towards the future and the best possible futures for art museums, these conversations, including ours, of course, will explore the capacity of art museums to accept, accept uh, to challenge accepted histories and advance the dialogues in which we need to engage with diverse collaborators and communities. So our session today will focus on craft, uh, and particularly the context for craft as they are chosen in American art museums and how museums themselves are influenced by the values associated with handmade objects. And to help me discuss that theme, I'll be joined by Anya Montiel, who is a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. Her recent exhibition, Ancestors Know Who We Are, explores the interwoven histories of Black and Indigenous peoples through art. She received her PhD in American Studies from Yale University, where she researched the intersections of Native American art, global arts and crafts, and material culture. She also holds bachelor's degrees in Native American Studies and Anthropology from the University of California at Davis. Hi, Anya. Thanks for joining. Hello, Good Glenn. You. Thank you very much. And we'll also uh, be in conversation today with Seth Rodney. Uh, Dr. Rodney is a former senior critic and opinions editor for Hyperallergic and is now a regular contributor to the New York Times. He has also written on art for many other platforms, including CNN, NBC, Art in America, American Craft Museum, uh, American Craft Ma Magazine, and other publications. In 2020, he won the Rabkin Arts Journalism Prize. And in 2022, um, Trumpet Fanfare won the Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Congratulations on that, Seth. He can regularly be heard on the podcast, The American Age. And one last thing I will share from all of our bios. Um, is that we work together on an exhibition at Crystal Bridges called Crafting America, uh, with also with Jen Paget, uh, Jenny Sorkin, and Bernie Herman. Uh, and we were part of that curatorial team that um, created an exhibition on the precise subject that we're about to discuss. So it was with that in mind that um, we thought it would be great to convene in this smaller group and discuss the opportunities and challenges about presenting craft in the American Art Museum today. So with those uh, pre preambles uh, over and done with, I'm now gonna hand over to Anya and ask her to share our first presentation. Anya, take it away. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and for the opportunity to be included on this panel and in the New York Historical Society series. As mentioned, I am a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. And for brevity, I'll just say the NMAI. Uh, previously, I was the curator of American and Native American women's art and craft in a position split between the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the NMAI. Before our discussion, uh, I would like to introduce some of the work I have done, especially with acquisitions of Native art for both museums and how these works have added new voices and stories into the collections. Next slide. As I mentioned, I'm a curator at the National Museum of the American Indian, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. There are two museum locations open to the public, one in Washington, D.C. along the National Mall, and the other in New York in Lower Manhattan. The NMAI became part of the Smithsonian in 1989 through an act of Congress. And despite the name, the museum is hemispheric and includes Indigenous artworks, historical items, photographs, archives, and medias across North, Central, and South America. As a curator, I am always guided by the mission and vision of the museum, especially, as we say, equity and social justice for the Native peoples of the Western Hemisphere through education, inspiration, and empowerment. Uh, next slide. 
for a year, I worked as a curator with the staff of the Renwick Gallery, which is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and is located really steps away from the White House. The Renwick is dedicated to American craft and is known for, as they say, celebrating makers, taking both innovative and time honored approaches to their work. The gallery opened in 1972 and its curators have organized numerous exhibitions that have really pushed the boundaries of craft and have really celebrated artists and their mediums. As a curator who works with indigenous art and artists, the term craft can be a difficult one. And um, as Glenn knows, I discussed this in my essay for Crafting America because the term craft has been an external label that has been imposed on indigenous artists that has often devalued their work economically, creatively, and ideologically, and has sort of perpetuated the status of anonymity. So I really wanted to sort of, you know, ad address that in the essay. But in working with the Renwick, their exhibitions have included native art since the beginning in 1972, and also the curators have really shown that craft is an expansive category and one where we should really acknowledge that artists throughout time have used various mediums to bring their stories and communicate their experiences in whether they use canvas or whether they use clay. So next slide. When I was part of the Renwick, the staff was preparing for the gallery's 50th anniversary the curator in charge of the Renwick, Nora Atkinson, surveyed the existing collection to see what gaps existed there. She realized that works by Native artists were a small amount of its collection, which doesn't reflect the history of American craft. And the main curator of the exhibition this present moment, Mary Savig, she really wanted the exhibition to acknowledge the present moment that we were in, which was the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the calls for social justice and equity across the nation. So together we worked on bringing in acquisitions to the Renwick collection that would fill in gaps, but also speak to our present moment and think about our future. One aspiration was to emerge from this present moment creating spaces and works that are therapeutic and synergistic and kinder. And so um, this is the essay that I wrote for that catalog, Respect, Reciprocity and Responsibility, A Way Forward. So I was tasked with um, answering what will American craft look like in the future? And really I then thought and shifted it to what should guide the future of craft. So my essay addressed how American craft and art have their origin stories and locales, but really this land has memory and this continent holds ancient interconnected knowledge systems from indigenous observations of the flora, the fauna, the cosmos. So indigenous scholars have articulated indigenous knowledges, worldviews and methodologies to counter the dominant Western paradigms and advance other ways of knowing. So then I look to indigenous scholars and how they are bringing forth these ideas of respect, reciprocity, and responsibility and apply those to American craft. Next slide. Joe Federson, for example, is an artist who works in glass, fiber, and printmaking. He lives on the Colville Reservation in Northeastern Washington State. The NMAI in New York had a solo exhibit of his work in 2003. From that show, the museum acquired the work on the right which is, as you can see here, titled Tire. It's made of glass, and you can see that there is a tire track that is over actually a woven design. And through a lot of his art, he is talking about the importance of the land, the land and how indigenous worldviews have always sort of communicated the land through art. And in thinking about bringing in something to the Renwick collection, uh, I helped them acquire this work called Horses and Deer. And that's the one on the left that is very bright, as you can see the yellow and the oranges. And so this is really his commentary about how in his area of Washington state, there are people who dump their horses there and the horses have kind of overrun the area and are really uh, taking a lot of resources, uh, food and water from the original inhabitants like deer. So here, hopefully you can see the deer person um, right there. And now the deer is really trying to survive amongst all these non-indigenous animals 
that have kind of been dumped in that area. So both works here are really referencing the land, but in different ways. Next slide. So Carla Goodleaf Hemlock is a Ganawage Mohawk textile and multimedia artist. Uh, and so we already had a work in the collection by her, the one on the right, Tribute to the Mohawk Iron Workers from 2008. So you can see that this is a quilt with cotton, glass bead sequins and thread. And so um, with this piece, she's really talking about how you have this iconic image of um, iron workers in New York on the beam but people didn't realize that some of the people depicted on that beam are Mohawk and the history of Mohawk as iron workers building all these amazing skyscrapers that we have, especially in Eastern cities. So she wanted to re really reflect and pay tribute to those Mohawk iron workers in the quilt. In thinking about what to bring into the Renwick, um, I brought in this work to the collection, which is called Art Destruction. And you can see it's a very beautiful work. There's a lot of floral design and with all with beads and crystals and sequins. There's actually the ruby red um, slippers from Wizard of Oz in the center. But this on the left, middle and right sides of the border are the words, our heart, our home, our soul. And inside the border, you see that vibrant scene. But really, these um, the slippers have this word tick tock on them. And then the TikTok kind of repeats throughout. And this is really a warning echoing in each corner of the quilt. And despite this outward beauty, our destruction, this quilt speaks to the current state of the planet and the global and global climate change. So on the reverse of the quilt, she writes, our destruction, our natural world is an environmental ticking time bomb on the eve of, of destruction. Time is running out. Our inaction will soon redefine those ruby red slippers to symbolize no place to call home. So this quilt is really a shrouded harbinger of what humans cannot lose, which is really our heart, our home, our soul. And so looking towards a better practice of how we pay respect to, to the beings. Next slide. I wanted to also bring in that um, at the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, we have a very expansive collection. Uh, we have about 1 million items in our collection. And so often we have native artists and community members who come to our storage facility to learn from the collection that we have. And recently Carla Hemlock and her husband, Babe, who is a woodworker, he makes cradle boards. They came to learn from the historical works that we have in the collection, but also they came to visit their artworks. So here is Carla with her uh, tribute to Mohawk Ironworkers quilt. And then here is Babe Hemlock uh, with his cradle board that also paid tribute to Mohawk Ironworkers in New York. And so uh, to have that opportunity for artists to come back and to visit with the works that are in the collection. And those videos of them talking about the significance of that work, of these works, will be on our social media outlets in a little bit. Next slide. Since the Renwick is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, there is the opportunity to have works from the Renwick be in other exhibitions in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And so I was looking at the existing collection there, and there are many works that are from the, the Taos Art Society. And so where you have a lot of these artists who were from the East Coast and from Europe who come to visit Taos, New Mexico, and they gain all this inspiration from the land and the people, and that becomes their artworks. So Dorothy Brett was one such artist who was originally from this aristocratic uh, London family. She came to Taos, New Mexico, and she even said that there she felt like she could be free from conventions. And here you will see her painting that depicts Pueblo women wearing shawls with their bodies sort of mimicking the curves of the mountains. Next slide. But now the collection includes this ceramic work by Virgil Ortiz, and he is from Cochiti Pueblo in Northern Mexico. So in his art, Virgil, Ortiz creates these futuristic worlds and characters where knowledge of the past provides guidance for future generations. So this jar references the Pueblo of 
Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which is a successful indigenous revolt against Spanish religious and military persecution of the Pueblo people in New Mexico. It then advances to the year 2180, where Pueblo lands and people are under attack again. So the female warrior Tahu depicted here with her, quo, uh, with her quiver and arrows on her back leads the army. So this work is, you have both works that are depicting Pueblo women, but in very different ways. And so both of those depictions are very important to have alongside to have a better conversation of the land and also the people of New Mexico. Next slide. The same is true for the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, I curated this exhibition called Ancestors Know Who We Are, which features the work of Afro-Indigenous women artists. And so they discuss how being mixed race and how gender affects the art that they do. I could have not done this exhibition without another exhibition that we had had called Indivisible, which is about African and native lives in the Americas and really talking about all the intersections between African and indigenous peoples in the Americas. So, and next slide. So I brought this new work into the collection uh, and it's featured in the exhibition, Ancestors Know Who We Are. This work is by Robson Brown, uh, a black and a Cherokee artist. She was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and also a Freedman descendant. So she was also a basket maker as well as a community organizer. And so you have this beautiful basket here. And so this is really showing about, this is an artist who is Afro-Indigenous. She is black and she is also indigenous and the importance of bringing those kind of stories and those kind of artists to the collection as well. And so all of this was really showing about how important it is to really reflect the diversity of indigenous experiences and, and lives. And we can really do that in bringing some of these acquisitions and also these artworks into exhibitions and museums. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anya. That was a great um, exposure to what you've been doing and also some fantastic examples for us to think about. Um, you know, whenever thinking about craft, one wants to proceed from the object. So it's great to start in that way. Thank you very much. Seth, uh, can I welcome you to the rostrum? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Right, so uh, I want to start off by saying thank you to the Luce Foundation for inviting us to this conversation and thank you very much to the New York Historical Society for hosting it. I am going to talk a bit about the museum uh, as a, a kind of um, discursive space. Um, a lot of what I'm about to say comes out of the research that uh, 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 undergirded my book, The Personalization of the Museum Visit, which is published by Routledge in 2019. Um, this sort of set the scene. Uh, my research had to do with uh, the question basically of how the museum visit has shifted expectations of the museum visit for visitors and for uh, museum researchers and museum staff, how these notions of what constitutes a proper visit, a valid visit to the museum, I wondered how they had shifted from the previous generation to the current one. Uh, uh, and a, a lot of this, the impetus for studying this comes out of me being a writer and a cultural critic um, um, who chose to focus on the meaning that works of art convey to a contemporary audience, particularly within uh, the museum setting. I'm, I'm really intrigued by the questions of um, how visitors participate with, come into a relationship with objects in the museum. Um, and so I'm gonna, talk a bit about the background to uh, uh, my study in terms of the, um, the disciplines that I looked at to inform my understanding of how the visitors change. One of the main uh, fields of inquiry is visitor studies, which is a discipline that comes 
into being basically in the 80s and 90s. Um, the 1990s is when the Visitor Studies Association was founded in the US. Uh, what Visitor Studies did, which was really crucial for the museum field, was it began to place in the field this idea that in order to properly understand what visitors were getting out of an exhibition, we had to examine not just their sort of demographic, demographic uh, 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 information, race, class, gender, where they live, um, how much money they make, all of these things, all of this data that museum researchers had, researchers had gathered about visitors, they found didn't actually indicate in any consistent way what visitors got out of a particular exhibition, what they took away from it, what they learned. Uh, so there's a crisis in the museum field in the 70s, and visitor studies really comes out of this crisis. And what visitor studies um, essentially, essentially made clear was that in order to understand what visitors uh, would take from an exhibition, we'd have to examine their motivations, their interests, and their experiences, rather than just their demographic status. Um, and visitor studies also questioned and rejected the idea of a universal approach to learning in museum. This has particularly far-reaching implications later, which I will get to. But I want to also paint, in painting this picture of the sort of background that underlies what uh, essentially comes to be called in the um, museum studies field, the uh, uh, onset of a new museology, that is a new way of conceiving of the visitor's relationship to the museum. What happens alongside this turn to meaning, um, which again coincides with the, uh, of uh, the founding of the visitor studies discipline. There's a few other things that are happening at the same time. There is a marketing revolution that is happening in the museum where museums have realized that in order to, to answer the call to be both more inclusive and diverse, that they needed to figure out ways to get other audiences besides middle-class ones, which has historically uh, been the main audience of museums. In order to do that, they would have to find ways to make the museum essentially more attractive, more palatable to these visitors. Now there's a marketing revolution that begins to happen in museums in around the 70s and 80s. And what that means is that um, marketing departments in museums start to take on the responsibility for, out, for visitor outreach. Uh, and the museums begin to put more money and more resources towards these efforts. At the same time, generally speaking, and this happens both in the U United States and the UK, I, I base my research primarily on institutions in the UK because this was that's where I did my graduate study at uh, University of London. And I looked at the Tate Museums as a sort of prime uh, 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 resources for my study. At the same time in both the US and the UK, um, there is a kind of experience economy coming into being where places like museums, but not only museums, also amusement parks and um, uh, public botanical gardens, um, similar civic spaces, are all coming into this understanding, which is, again, influenced by marketing, that what visitors want is not just to uh, uh, learn something, but to have a particular experience, a particular experience that helps them grow as a person. Uh, this onset of the marketing and revolution and experience economy and the pressures to make museums both more diverse and relevant all kind of come into the museum uh, uh, research, uh, museum researchers focus on this idea of, an, of a kind of visitor that is an enlightened consumer. Uh, uh, and, and this is key this notion of the visitors as enlightened consumers is key to how museums 
go on to treat visitors. Um, uh, and part of what I will discuss is how um, craft comes into that conversation around what visitors want um, in, a, in a particularly um, 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 unique way. I want to also talk about how the museum field now is trying to grasp what visitors want. One of the ways that they do that is by using um, the, the adjacent discipline of psychology because they want to understand what makes people happy and what makes people creative and how people employ that creativity to be happy. At the same time, there's this influx of this, um, what I would call management theory, which looks, um, and you can see this in very much play, play, playing out very much in corporate settings where experts and uh, consultants are brought in to figure out how employees are intrinsically motivated, how they have a sense of autonomy um, or a sense of mastery of a thing and a sense of improvement over time. And all of these sort of tongues are what marketing departments begin to use in order to grasp how to craft an experience for the visitor that is uh, memorable, useful, compelling to them. Uh, thus, and I want to quote from my book here, thus the art object um, in this new conception of the visitor is imagined to lose its lustrous in inscrutability and incommensurability as it is both rendered as an object of consumptive desire and an object of amateur exegesis, which is a fancy way of saying that we start looking, we stop looking at museum re researchers who have taken on this new conception of the visitor, stop looking at um, uh, visitors as just people to be educated. This slide here that is up now is an image of children in a museum setting at the Reina Sofia Museum um, being taught, um, being led by, uh, we assume those, the, the adults in the uh, image are their teachers. This is typically what we, the previous generation, would imagine a museum visit to look like. This is uh, the ignorant visitor coming in, having their gaze, having their understanding tutored by someone. Sometimes it's a curator, sometimes it's a teacher who happens to be on hand. And thus they go away from the exhibition having grasped something fundamental. This has actually been kind of upended. And I think that craft actually um, plays a very crucial, a very unique role in um, the new conception of um, engagement in the museum. And I think part of it is that craft, in addition to the idea that um, uh, that the uh, object, the museum object, is can be interpreted by the visitor on their own, that they can make meaning by simply being in a position to uh, 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 have um, uh, a kind of intellectual engagement with the object in front of them that craft also introduces this notion of marvel, this notion of this thing can be amazing, this thing can um, be inspiring, and the notion which is um, tacit, but is, is, is there in some way, the notion that this thing in some real way can actually be possessed. Because many craft artists actually have a practice where they on, they're on Instagram, um, they're on Facebook, and they sell some of their wares there. So even the things that, uh, even though the things that appear in museums clearly are part of museum collections or they're part of um, collections that have been borrowed from other institutions or other collectors, there is a sense in which, in some instances, the object can actually come into the visitor's possession. May I have the next si slide, please? Right, so this is a great example of, um, and a lot of the work I wanna, I, I wanna say I'm showing is crafty. I don't know that uh, everyone, uh, in, in, even in this audience uh, or on this panel would agree that this constitutes, squarely constitutes craft, but um, it's a useful example for me because it definitely comes out of this um, this is Lisa Liu's uh, uh, monumental work, Kitchen, which was displayed 
at the um, Whitney Museum uh, in the show Making a Knowing Craft in, in Art, 1952-2019. I saw it in 2021. It is an astonishing work. Uh, it's a full scale, uh, exactly detailed kitchen, which is uh, encrusted in a rainbow of glistening beads. It's made by Lou fashioning the objects for initially out of paper mache, then painting them, and then applying all the beads in a mosaic of uh, surface pattern. Uh, Lisa Lou has argued publicly that uh, the work argues for the dignity of labor. And there is a way clearly um, that this uh, uh, work conveys the notion of labor, the notion of the hand at work. Um, Every, I, I uh, went to the show and I stood in front of this work for a good five minutes. And I think I could have stood for a good 10 more. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's so detailed. Everything from the curtains to the pie that's in the oven to the inside of the oven is completely covered in bees. It's, it's beautiful and it's enthralling. And it precisely um, gets at this idea that the without sort of curatorial handholding that a visitor can stand in front of this object and develop a relationship there understand the the the, the work that um, likely went into this I, as i mentioned it took lisa lu um five years to complete this work and i think that that kind of investment of time really um really comes across when you're actually in uh, are in the presence of the of the work may I have the next slide Right, so this is Tamara Kostyanovsky. Uh, this piece is called Redwood. And um, I discovered Tamara's work, it must have been six, seven years ago, uh, the group show in Chelsea. And I saw this, uh, this piece. It is uh, 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 meant to be sort of a cross, -check, cross section of a tree stump, obviously. But the clothes, the textiles that go into this actually come are their repurposed clothing that uh, uh, that uh, Tamara at some point owned, or actually a lot of the, the for this particular piece, it's her father's clothing. Um, she mentions that uh, uh, in traveling to New York, um, and I forget where she originated. I want to say it's Israel, but I'm not positive of that. Uh, she said that the only thing that she could take with her were her clothes. And uh, 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 I believe that when her father passed away, she also inherited that. And she used this clothing to create these um, really wonderfully colorful and inventive sort of replicas of natural objects. May I have the next slide? Um, here you can see that it gets a lot more inventive when she begins to uh, attempt to uh, kind of reconstruct um, uh, cow hides and um, cows that have been sort of um, dissected, and and uh, and and she also you can see off to the well in both um, uh, uh, cow sections facing us you can see that on the inside there are these. Um, these uh, birds um, that she's also made from used or discarded clothing. So all this work is really in, in the sort of same vein as Lisa Lu's work is, is made by hand, is, 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 is it crafted with extreme care and attention to detail. And the word that I want to use to describe this work is beautiful. It is stunningly um, uh, visually compelling. And again, it, it's the kind of work that begins to, or takes part in this notion that, again, the visitor can really come into a relationship to this work, understanding intuitively the, the, the nature of labor that it takes, it takes to make this kind of object and the meticulous uh, 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 concern with detail. Uh, uh, may I have the next slide? And this is the work of um, Alison Elizabeth Taylor. She is an American artist who 
uh, is based in New York. She lives in Brooklyn, I believe, and she shows with um, James Cohen Gallery. Uh, this work is uh, marketry, and I did not know that marketry existed before I found out about Alison Elizabeth Taylor. And what it consists of is the layering of very thin uh, panels of wood. Uh, it's hard to convey, uh, or rather really impossible to convey through a slide, the dimensionality of this work. But this work is actually, if were you to stand in front of it, you would see that it is, it, it is very dimensional. It consists of several layers of wood um, seamlessly um, glued together to create this kind of, um, of portrait. Um, the layers of wood are painted, they're um, uh, uh, sanded and, and, and arranged in a certain way to um, essentially give one a sense of three-dimensional space. Again, um, this work kind of rides the line between quote unquote craft and quote unquote fine art. I um, really appreciate it because again, it is, and I've been to Allison's studio, so I've seen her work on this. It is very much her hand in this process. This is very much about a kind of um, desire to represent something that exists in the world, something that she's seen. And it comes out of this idea that it is the hand ultimately that guides her to through this process of making rather than the sort of um, conceptual uh, uh, armature or conceptual uh, uh, goal. And that's essentially what I wanted to say about um, the relationship with the visitor to the museum and how craft sort of comes in to this relationship in this kind of unique way, um, following on this trend of, of, uh, of expectations for the, visit, for the visit now, which include coming into a kind of intimacy with the art object without the sort of intervening hand or voice of the curatorial expert. Great, thank you, Seth. That last point is actually quite crucial, I think, um, that the craft object in some way is perceived to speak for itself, though it has what you earlier um, were alluding to as a kind of self-evidence. Um, and it makes me wonder Anya, about the same quality in the case of the projects that you've been doing, maybe I could start with a question to you if you don't mind, and whether you think that um, craft in the context of a, a project that's about um, so, so certain subject position, let's say Native American uh, art or African American art or combination of the two as you showed, um, whether you think that craft feels like it's kind of self-exemplifying or making the case in a way that Seth is describing, but for a particular group of people and how you would sort of um, evaluate that dynamic as it's operative in a museum context. Well, I think especially um, if you think about indigenous art, um, I don't think that most people get really uh, education about it or learn about native art, um, especially not very much in high school you know, maybe they might take a class at university. Um, but so I do think that, you know, of course there might be cultural context that, you know, someone who's Mohawk can look at a work and kind of get like certain, you know, visual cues to sort of say like, oh, I know exactly what this reference is. But I do think that when you think about indigenous art, uh, unfortunately, it uh, there has not been enough education about it. So I think that some people, this is all new to them. I think about how when the Renwick had the Hearts of Our People exhibition uh, on view there, organized by the Minneapolis Institute of Art, that I would talk to groups and they would say, I never knew this were there were that many women artists who are Native American. <laughs> and, you know, for me, it was shocking because you walk through the National Museum of the American Indian and most of those artworks are made by women, mm. people who identify as women. And it's that sort of thing where um, because those names are not familiar or maybe those names are not discussed, you know, they would come and say, oh, I know who Maria Martinez is, the San Ildefonso Potter. You know, that is maybe what glimpse they get when they go to art, you know, uh, an art course. But when you introduce all these, they're kind of surprised by it. 
So, uh, you know, I do think that, you know, that's always the struggle with museums. How much context do you want to put in there? Mm. You know, do you want to put uh, an extended label for every single work? Or do you want to just sort of say, I am introducing a theme to you. And then the visitors sort of kind of work with how does that theme apply to all the works in this room? So I think that that's always, you know, a, a constant sort of struggle of how much information should the museum provide? You know, of course, we have information about so many works within our museum collection, but do we really, um, I, I think when it comes to, especially some works of native art, that there are people who kind of need more context, like especially with the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, um, Virgil Ortiz talks about when he goes in Europe to Europe, people have learned about it. Europeans know about that, but Americans have not heard about the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So in that kind of context, there are kind of different layers, you know, that visitors are coming with that they might have no information about what they're seeing before them. And I want to also just add to that, Anya, and completely agree with you. And I wonder whether part of what happens in museums is there's this deep respect that you have as a researcher, um, as uh, uh, someone who spent time with these objects and learning their context, that that respect for that history also is at the root of some desire to communicate that to the visitor because you're saying, because you, you imagine, you're not going to get all of this. I'm giving you like a, a 10 or uh, uh, less of what I've discovered. And there's an incredibly rich history here. Uh, and because I, I know this history, it's re I feel like it's really important. I imagine that museum curators like you would say to yourself, I think it's really important that you get a little bit of this, at least. I would say yes. You know, I do understand that there are always limits when it comes to label writing. And so often you write a lot of text and then the editor says, you know, you have to realize that, you know, we have to do it to only, you know, 50 to 100 words. So all this sort of gets cut. But, um, you know, I, I think about your work with visitor studies and how even today, you know, we are so conscious of social media. And mm. so we wonder about how you know, is it something that we do an interview with an artist and then that's posted on social media and then maybe that draws people to go to at least our website to learn more or maybe they come to the museum. So there are all these ways that I think, especially when you look at museum education, we're always trying to say like, how can we reach multiple visitors? So are there the, the people that read everything? Are there the people that want to watch a video? Are there the people that they have five minutes uh, and that's all they are going to give you and what can you kind of, you know, bring to them? So, you know, that that happens, you know, frequently when we think about uh, the museum experience. Yeah. So the museum is basically mixing its pitches for, you know, different visitors. Precisely. Uh, so, so there's a, a really interesting thing I, I feel like I'm to here, which has to do with a strange combination between amazement on the one hand and accessibility on the other. Mm. which seems quite particular to craft because, mm. you know, it, it might well be that um, a conventional uh, fine artwork, a painting might amaze without being accessible. And mm. then a craft object that's of perhaps lesser um, evident labor as an example of Eliza Liu, or um, perhaps doesn't have the kind of specificity of traditional knowledge that some of the objects that you were showing, for example, Anya has. Um, might feel, you know, accessible, but not amazing. So when we look at a museum craft object, a muse museumified craft object, often what we're seeing is an unusual combination between those two things. And that does seem to create a kind of aperture through which some curatorial expertise can flow and some communication can flow. It's almost like an opportunity. But, um, so that sounds great. <laughs> but Anya, I wanted to circle back to something you said right at the beginning, which felt very important which is that from the point of view of certain native artists, it can also be demeaning or um, problematic to have their work uh, categorized as craft precisely because of the histories of categorization that have been applied to certain groups of people. And I would look, love to hear you talk a little bit about that. And then Seth, I wanna ask you about the same question of elevation versus 
uh, de elevation, which was occasioned by your examples. But Anya, for, um, do you want to take that on? Sure. Uh, a lot of my research, you know, sort of started with examining the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. So it's a federal agency uh, within the United States and the US Department of the Interior, established in 1935. As a way, really, it was economic development for Native people through arts and crafts. So really, it was all making for the marketplace, making to sell. And so that you know, kind of legacy um, of having the federal government intervene and also sort of say, like, this is one way that you can make money is by selling arts and crafts, by having an art cooperative, um, you know, a way, especially for, especially for rural development. So there were a lot of sort of um, work with, like, how can you get an arts and crafts shop? Um, so when tourists come through during a certain time, you have a shop all ready for them, you know, so they can just buy right there at a shop. And so, you know, when you have, you know, there was a lot of discussion about price points and about if you want to actually have someone buy something, it can't be more than this amount. And so that might mean that your art is going to be only of a certain size. You're going to kind of miniaturize things or, you know, you have to get things that are very fancily decorated versus something that is um, uh, not decorated, like maybe it's a water jar, you know, you have to have decorations, all these things. So when you have that kind of legacy, then, you know, you have sort of American craft. And so you have this sort of, you know, really kind of, you know, two kind of like parallel lines I see in like history when you think about even, you know, some of the work with the Southern Highlands Guild and all these kind of rural initiatives that you have for um, looking at people in sort of rural parts of the United States and how can you help them through economic development. Um, but, you know, when that kind of, you know, histories are coming up, it is then devaluing Native art. And then people are saying, I will not pay this amount of money for that textile or that basket because they are not viewing it as art. They are viewing it as sort of like a craft work that someone is doing. And so there is a lot of tension. So when I was working with the Renwick, and I was going to artists, I was very clear, like, you know, I am working also with the Renwick Gallery, um, which is part of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, but it's also sort of known as kind of like a craft museum. And I will say that because of the Renwick, you know, hosting hearts of our people, you know, there was already sort of a better feeling about the, the institution. You know, you think about the Wonder Show, you think about Burning Man, you think about all the kind of expansive sort of exhibitions that the Renwick has had. And then it was more of, you know, we we kind of respect what the institution is doing versus this kind of feeling that if I'm at a craft museum, that means that my work is being sort of isolated into one area and it's not speaking to other things. And so that's why, you know, as I'm sort of struggling with the term craft, I kind of feel like we need to acknowledge that artists create and they use very various mediums in order to get the message across. So you have someone like Joe Federson who works with glass, he works with fiber, he does printmaking. So all of those things are very important to the art that he does in order to express himself. So we shouldn't sort of make a limitation and say like, oh, that is a craft artist versus, you know, whatever you want to call someone, you know, um, you know, and it's awful craft artist versus artist or something like that. And yeah. so I'm just, you know, I just want people to kind of understand that we need to be very expansive, mm -hmm. you know, and we need to also celebrate what these artists are doing in order to get and communicate their experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you're speaking to something that I felt throughout my career, which is that two things simultaneously seem necessary. And it's quite difficult to hold them both in your head at once if you're a person and possibly impossible if you're an institution, one of which is to elevate craft and say, this is, um, uh, this, this is worthy of being taken seriously just as any artwork would be. So let's not create a secondary status. And the other thing is to um, use craft as a means of 
regardless of what we were saying before, eliminating the kind of elitism that attends the artwork. And of course, the great approach or the, the great appeal of that first approach, um, which you could even possibly extend to oil painting, like let's let's remember that oil painting itself is a craft, at least in some of its dimensions, mm -hmm. and that perhaps creates pathways for people that otherwise might have felt excluded from the narrative of a canonical art historical museum would give them a way in, you know, as in the, you know, you're walking through the Louvre and you see somebody making a dead on copy of a painting that's on the wall. And that's a completely different way of associating to the collection, of course, to see that happening. Um, but it's quite difficult to do both of those things at once because the very fact that you're trying to disrupt the elitist narrative tends to also drag the object down into something that's more every day. And that leads me to the question I want to ask you, Seth, which is that it was very striking to me that the three artists that you showed, uh, Liza Lou, Tamara uh, Koshinovsky, and Alison Elizabeth Taylor, all were using subjects that were themselves quite, I would almost say debased, but mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. every day at best, mm -hmm. you know, so suburban kitchen, mm -hmm. hanging meat, <laughs> and then if you know Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor's work, um, she often will be working with still life imagery or very kind of casually glimpsed scenes like the one that you showed mm -hmm. um, that would not normally have seen to be worthy of the expenditure of labor and skill that she's putting into them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a real continuity across the three artists in that way. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you make of that, that um, action of bringing to uh, a non-consequential subject, a great new mm. consequential work. Yeah, well, that might be the thing that which you've just identified might be the thing that actually makes the work seem more fine arty than quote unquote crafty. And I and I I'm already boring myself by using these quotes, these air quotes. It's just <laughs> I'm gonna air quote myself to death here. But the point is that. Precisely because it has that kind of conceptual gambit at work that it is that that these artists, these women are, are specifically using scenes or things in the world that are not particularly sacralized or not particularly um, uh, I don't know for lack of a better term, highfalutin. Um, it's precisely because they do that that the work seems to have or feels like it has a kind of um, intellectual undergirding, right? Then just maybe then just a, I don't know, then just a textile or maybe uh, as compared to just a woven basket. And I think that we struggle with this and by we, I mean people in these discourses who care about these objects struggle with recognizing as Anya does uh, the, the, worthiness of the object that is made by hand, that um, the work to that person's life and their livelihood. And we struggle with this, um, in which with that in comparison to the object that is more sort of cerebral, the more ob object that is more intellectual. And I think that, you know, part of my own struggle with this um, really begins with my first mu museum visit. Because when I went to, as a 17 year old to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, I saw these objects around me, um, uh, pieces by Louis Bourgeois, um, by Jacques Mubala. Uh, and I thought to myself, wow, these are objects that I'm not supposed to do anything with except think about and mm -hmm. talk with other people about. They're here to actually spur some kind of intellectual engagement. They're literally non-utilitarian objects, right? You can't use them to open a can of beans. Like you can't, you can't do anything with them except and to, to an extent is treat them as um, uh, 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 these occasions for deep thought. And then I encounter craft material, craft workmanship, craft uh, uh, art. And I have this moment of like cognitive dissonance. Like, yes, on the one hand, this comes out of clear tradition and a way of working that is uh, 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 historically traceable and that is key to understanding a people, a culture. And yet you can actually use it to pour water into a glass. So um, I think that that remains a struggle. 
Yeah. Well, I suppose one argument you could make is that the craft object that performs as an art object is perhaps an even more complicated situation because it's simultaneously affording you the opportunity to do precisely that kind of conceptual Mm -hmm. responding at the Mm -hmm. same time as it um, sutures itself potentially into the texture of your life. Mm -hmm. Remember when we were working on the Crystal Bridges show Mm -hmm. together, guys, that one of the main takeaways that they wanted to give people was you can go home and make something, remember? Right. We're always right. talking about that. Right. It's supposed to be directly inspiring. Like that afternoon, go make something, <laughs> you know? Right, precisely. Mentality. Um, so we just have uh, five minutes left. So I actually wanted to circle back, Anya, to your essay title, uh, which is Respect, Re- Reciprocity, and Responsibility, because it, it seems to me that those three words um, have been kind of hovering over our conversation here mm. might also serve as a good takeaway for museum professionals and thinking how they're approaching craft specifically. So I know you were talking about it in your essay in a slightly different context, but would you mind talking about one, two, or three of those values as applied to curatorial practice itself and how we might sort of take that away and uh, apply it to our own projects? Sure. Um, you know, with, um, with the work that I do, I really think it's important for people to understand that um, indigenous art is part of American art. And when you have museums who are maybe putting um, native art, you know, next to a painting by Bierstadt, um, you need to sort of understand, well, what is really, what do you want those to do? And so I think about how in the essay that I wrote for this present moment, where I had to think about the future, it is really, I'm, I'm not just including uh, native artists, but I am including a lot of the artists who are in the Renwick 50th show to see about how the works that they are creating talks about how we are really part of a community. And so how do we see ourselves as part of a community? Also, I think about um, uh, Prom uh, Sefuentes and how her work um, is these protest posters that were lended out at um, at various marches and it was like a lending library. And so it was this thing about like coming together and community of making, but also sharing and reusing. I think about also um, thinking about, um, you know, and thinking about responsibility, especially with the Carla Hemlock quilt, that it is this thing that we have to understand that there are many beings around us. And so, talking about not just humans and how we interact with humans, but also how we are, you know, paying attention to things that fly, things who live on the land, things that are in the water, things that are so small that we don't even notice. And sort of drawing upon that about like, you know, how are we, you know, how are we kind of, um, you know, really sort of being responsible for what we're doing. And I think about this also, we can think about this in museum practice. I think about how, what am I leaving behind for 200 years from now? Mm. So in 200 years from now, when a museum visitor comes to the Renwick or to the National Museum of American Indian, and they are looking at some of these acquisitions, are they then able to sort of get a greater understanding of what artists from our current time are addressing and dealing with? And I think that all these things are really important to kind of think about how we're you know talking about the maker and their practices and also how they are interacting and the stories and the messages but also i'm thinking about in our practices as scholars Mm. you know how then are we sort of you know leaving you know a memory of this present time for the future Mm. it's great thinking about in the long duration that Mm. seems really important um seth can you give me 60 seconds (laughs) on respect responsibility reciprocity yeah, uh, I think that what I like about um, what Anya said is that um, she models taking uh, responsibility for the objects in her care, and she extends that. And this is really important because I think this is also part of that switch from um, um, a previous museology to the new one, is that we realize that alongside allowing visitors to have sort of more creative agency in the moment of encounter with the odd object, that curators are not only responsible for objects, they're also responsible for people. They're responsible for the people whose 
objects they are studying, but they're also responsible to their audiences. Um, and I think um, that used to be not quite as widely understood. Um, and I think so respect and responsibility, there's a kind of continuum um, there. It's not just respect for the objects, it's this sort of like sacralized uh, 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 things to be, um, uh, uh, to be preserved, but they're also talking, we're talking about at the same time, um, people, actual human beings and their ways of life that also deserve preservation. Yeah, that's a great note to end on because I suppose that if we continue to care about craft as much as we all seem to, that's because we think that craft at the end of the day, despite all the complexity offers connection points to people and their lives and their experiences in a way that is unique. Uh, can talk about it all day long, but ultimately it does come down to that fact that what we're valuing at the end of the day is not just the object, but also the person that stands behind it and craft makes that evident in a special way. So Precisely. great conversation, guys. Um, yes, indeed. I just wanted to say to the audience um, that uh, in a couple of weeks on June 9th, there will be another of these conversations oh. really chaired by Melissa Ho and we'll feature Elisa uh, Alexander and Abby Chen. They'll be talking about Asian American art inside and outside the museum. Uh, so please come back for that next one in the series. And uh, again, uh, thank you to our host, New York Historical Society and to the Luce Foundation for bringing us together. And above all, thanks to Anya and Seth for a great conversation. Thank you, Glenn. Take care. Okay, take care.